Australia's High Commissioner to Samoa and His Excellency Mr. David Ward, the British High Commissioner to Samoa. This panel discussion today would not have been possible without the generous sponsorship of the British Academy, the British High Commission to Samoa, and the Women in Leadership in Samoa program funded by Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and administered by UN Women and UNDP. A special thanks to my colleague Suani Ma'a and our nursing students for the lovely lays and the bouquets that we have this morning and to my colleague who assisted with arranging of the venue. To begin this morning's program on a positive note, I would like to invite to the podium Malaysia Lasiolangi Dr. Malama, Malaysia to deliver an opening prayer. Uh, okay, uh, let us pray. Uh, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for your gifts that come with it. We thank you for the fellowship that we uh, uh, represent this morning. And we thank you in particular for the spirit of the day which we are celebrating all around the world. We ask your blessings on us and our discussion today. And we ask your forgiveness for all our wrongs. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This panel discussion today takes place in celebration and in commemoration of International Women's Day and occurs in conjunction with similar panels taking place in Morocco and Malaysia. It seeks to bring together key stakeholders to discuss the progress and challenges to women holding political <coughs> office in their respective countries. Researchers at NUS have done extensive work in this field with the Center for Samoan Studies publishing a well-referenced and cited report on the topic in recent years. The other partners of this project, the University of Lincoln, University of Casablanca in Morocco, and Monash University in Malaysia, bring their expertise to exploring this important issue. Universities continue to provide a space for spirited discourse on issues salient to the development of the countries in which they are based, and benefit from the supportive leadership to pursuing these endeavors. At this time, I would like to invite our esteemed Vice Chancellor of the National University of Samoa to deliver welcoming remarks. Welcome, Professor Alec Ekoroma. Professor Ramona. Opa ia Samoa o la o ule to e papauina fa tupe o muli o taula fonga. O wa opa ia o ma e o na tosi lauti ma manu fa hititi. Opa ia ma ma manu o le panel la o fionga te mai tai fa pule te fionga i fia me na o mi mata afa fa pia le fionga ma manu a lo fa tu au. The UN Resident Coordinator in Samoa, Dr. Simona Marinescu. To wa fionga taula papa, muli angatele, ma muli talo. Fa ma loli fai ole faiva, fa fitai mul awai mai ile nei fa tal noanga taua. E ati manatuai, muli anga ilumo si o tatu watch nu. Ia ole afangatonu le fi maina. Le aunga le nei fa moe moe. Members of Parliament, the diplomatic corps, heads of government departments and uh, independent organisations, the press, the staff of NUS, ladies and gentlemen. I am indeed privileged to be launching this panel today. 
This is the kind of event that every man would wish they were a woman. It is an auspicious occasion and discussion on the way forward for Samoa, discussed by prominent women leaders of Samoa on this International Day for Women. I thank the Center for Samoan Studies for arranging this discussion, which will be screened widely as our people and other countries in the world will need to hear of the various perspectives and achievements as to, where, as to whether there are barriers and also to look at barriers to political participation by women and more importantly, what the solutions are. The women of Samoa have actually uh, continued to make significant strides in other areas, including educational achievement. For instance, we have just last month enrolled a record number of students, 3,643 students, and 68% of them are women. We have 171 academic staff in NUS, and 60% of them are women. So there is educational attainment there by women. There seems to be no barriers. I know there's an increasing number of women with outstanding qualifications leading various sections of government and the private sector. So again, there doesn't seem to be any impediments for women advancing in office, in other offices, in other areas. There are levers that can be used to increase women's participation in other areas of the workforce, and we discovered that last month. We made a decision that we need more women to succeed in the trade areas. So we obtained funding from the Education Sector Fund, that is from New Zealand and Australia, to issue 220 scholarships in the technical and vocational education trade area and give preference to women. So I'm pleased to say to this audience that we now have a 300% increase in the number of women in the trades, with 70 of them on scholarships. So where gender equity is important, levers can be found to effect positive change. And why are more women in parliament a positive change? Some of you will have those answers. But my answer is that because we know that women in parliament result in more meaningful debate that revolves around issues that are more important to women, children, and families. The smell and effect of testosterone is diluted with more women in parliament, <laughs> resulting in a gender in a chancellor and kinder of place if not country. A short film will be produced from the video recordings of this panel to further develop our understanding of barriers and solutions to women's political participation in our parliament. I look forward to watching your deliberations on TV because I have to attend elsewhere and I'm sure the whole country and the world will learn a lot from your discussion. Thank you very much so far. <coughs> Thank you very much, Iono Professor Ikaroma, for those wonderful, welcoming remarks. This project is funded generously by the British Academy, and I'm quite pleased to have His Excellency, Mr. David Ward, present with us today. The pandemic has made it very difficult for us to move around, so we're very happy that you're with us in Samoa and able to, to speak to our audience here today. Without the support of the British Academy, this important work could not take place. So at this point, it is my pleasure to invite His Excellency, Mr. David Ward, to deliver short remarks on behalf of the British High Commission. Thank you, thank you. 
uh, Vice Chancellor, distinguished panel members, fellow members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this kind invitation to say a few words on, at this panel on the occasion of International Women's Day on women's political participation. It's a great pleasure to join you here today. Ladies and gentlemen, almost all of the close to 200 countries of the world, including my own, the United Kingdom, and that in which we now found ourselves, the independent state of Samoa, are committed to promoting parity of participation by women and men in politics and decision making. They are committed to international law through their adoption of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, one of the fundamental documents of the United Nations. Almost all countries have signed the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, agreed in 1979. Samoa ratified it in 1992. At Beijing in 1995, all countries of the world came together to consider progress and agreed the Beijing Platform for Action, which aims to, quote, remove all the obstacles to women's active participation in all spheres of public and private life through a full and equal share in economic, social, cultural, and political decision-making, unquote. The Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, the internationally agreed targets for the development of the world, include one specifically on gender equality, committing all countries to, quote, achieve gender equality and empowerment for all women and girls, unquote. And they note also that gender equality is integral to achieving all of the remaining goals. So how are we all doing? Well. Thanks to UN Women, let me give you a few statistics. 22 countries currently have an elected woman head of state or government, and 119 have never had an elected woman leader. Only 13 countries currently have an elected woman head of government. Only 21% of government ministers around the world are women. And in only 14 countries do women currently occupy 50% or more of ministerial positions. Let us look at participation in national parliaments. 25% of all national parliamentarians in the world are women. This is up from 11% in 1995, but still means there are three times as many men as women parliamentarians. Only four countries have 50% or more women parliamentarians in their lower houses, Rwanda, Cuba, Bolivia, and the United Arab Emirates. 27 states have fewer than 10% women parliamentarians, and there are four with no women parliamentarians at all. Three of those are in the Pacific Island states, or among Pacific Island states, where women parliamentarians across the region represent only 6% of parliamentarians. So why is women's participation in politics so low? Already, uh, the Vice Chancellor has mentioned structural barriers, including discriminatory laws. There are capacity gaps due, for example, to poorer access for women to education, perhaps not here where we have heard such uh, uh, impressive statistics from the Vice Chancellor, but around the world. There are attitudes and stereotypes. In 2011, the United Nations General Assembly Resolution on Women's Political Participation noted that, quote, women in every part of the world continue to be marginalized from the political sphere, often as a result of discriminatory laws, practices, attitudes, and gender stereotypes, low levels of education, lack of access to health care, and the disproportionate effect of poverty on women, unquote. Current rates of progress mean it will take a long time to achieve equal political participation. Looking back to those statistics I began with, at the current rate of progress, it will take until 2063 for women to achieve equal representation in national parliaments, until 2077 in positions as government ministers, and it will take until 2151 for the world to reach gender parity in the highest leadership positions as elected heads of state and government. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you all have many ideas about uh, why 
uh, it is taking so long and what can be done about it. And I look forward uh, to hearing the ideas of the panel and the audience. And I wish you uh, good luck in your discussions today and hope they will bring us closer uh, to resolving these uh, issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for those uh, introductory comments. Um, well, as you can see from the program, I'm going to be the moderator. But uh, I'm probably one of the luckiest moderators because I've got a very distinguished panel uh, of, of people here who uh, you would rather listen to than me. I just want to start off my brief remarks by saying uh, that this morning, as I'm sitting here, I think back uh, of my mother. And uh, early in the morning, every day, uh, we were all sleeping in our Samoan Fale, uh, in our mosquito nets. Um, mine is a big family, 14 children. And uh, the first sound I hear in the morning, apart from the roosters, is my mother singing a hymn. And God help you, help if you don't sit up and sing along. Uh, it's one of the many memories uh, of my mother that I have. Um, so as we celebrate International Women's Day, I want to localize it a little bit more uh, by just that simple remembrance. Today, um, as I said, we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, uh, we have in your program uh, uh, short biograph uh, biographies of our speakers, and I'm not going to read them out uh, in the interest of time. But perhaps uh, I can go straight into uh, our program, and maybe uh, what I'll do is I will give each panelist a chance to speak on each of the questions, and I will start from question one and share some thoughts from our panelists. I want to make this as interactive as possible, and if time allows, it'll be wonderful also to have some contributions from the audience. Um, so the first question, as you can see from there, is uh, the barriers to the participation of indigenous women in political life in the country. Uh, and maybe um, we can start by, from the other end of the table, by asking La Fionga Ya Limulamandu Alofatu Au to kick off our discussion on that question. Good morning to you all. Um, getting straight into the question, the barriers um, of um, bearing down uh, for women's political participation. I believe there are different barriers, uh, but to me personally and my experience, it's really um, the opportunity to sit in the village uh, phonos, uh, where the, I think that's where it should all start, is getting participated in the village council's meeting and being heard 
because that's where your election comes from. It's from your village, from your constituency. That's the main barrier I find that it's difficult for the women to get into those meetings and get the opportunity to speak because that's where they then get uh, known of what they can um, you know, give, what they can serve uh, the constituency for. That's, that's the starting point of where they get known and what the women can uh, offer. Um, I leave the other side to the uh, other uh, members, I'm sure they have been, but that's the main one. And the second one is this negative talk about a lot of financial um, responsibilities and the need to have a lot of money in order to get into uh, politics and to being elected as a member of parliament. Yes, you, did, you do need some money, but I believe a lot of sharing the experiences of those that were before us, especially with the male, of how much money is involved with their campaigning and how much they spend in giving and giving and giving, that's where I realize it discourages some of the women um, to get into the uh, politics. So I really believe those are the two main ones from uh, my side. And uh, I, f I really think that it needs us who are in the uh, parliament now to encourage the young ones on a positive note that you don't really need that much uh, financial uh, money in order to serve the uh, constituency. There are a lot of other ways to serve your constituency. And that's what I've been trying to do in the last three, four years, uh, mixing with the young ones, especially the current um, leaders, the current uh, chief executive officers and general managers, assistant chief executive officers, and sharing my own experiences and encouraging them of getting into the village uh, council of Matais and be heard. And also you don't really need that 300,000 in order to get into uh, being elected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liberal uh, Man, for, for those thoughts. Can I uh, ask uh, um, Melissa, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, thank you to the British Academy, but also the National University of Samoa for hosting uh, this. I... Um, I guess the comments that I'm going to make <clears throat> reflects um, an official that attended Parliament for 10 years. Um, and one of the fundamental barriers, because I don't believe there are legislative or structural ones, but one of the fundamental barriers in my view is whether women are willing to enter the environment that we currently have um, prevailing in our parliament. Um, I think it's a hostile, um, aggressive, um, and abusive place at the moment, and it has been for a long time. I always um, <clears throat> perhaps toyed about thinking about going to parliament until I watched and heard um, women MPs, and I'm thinking particularly of Tuala Teresa Hunter Maliator, attempting to raise issues about education, which all of you will know she had a particular experience and knowledge of, and to be roundly um, abused about her personal life and about the fact that she didn't know anything. And I think that, for me, um, illustrated one of the 
greatest barriers for women to go into the house is being strong and courageous enough to actually deal with the working environment that currently exists. I mean, I, you listen to, and I guess um, um, the Honourable Fear Me has been the target of the latest examples of that sort of hostility. Um, but if you listen to any session of Parliament, uh, the nature of the discourse, um, the abuse, the aggression, um, that's the barrier that women face. But it also won't change until women are in the house. So the question is how we can ease the way of more women um, who have experience and knowledge and wisdom to contribute, but who have to consider <clears throat> their own uh, um, self-preservation, I guess, if they're um, going to, to step into uh, what is a, an angry house. So, um, you know, I, I think about it, and the, and the words that, that spring to mind is the discourse, often by only one person, is crude, it's rude, and it's graceless. So women in the house are needed to change that environment and also change the, the, the manner in which we govern ourselves so that um, respect and honour and dignity is restored to the house of the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, Dr. Simone, if I may ask uh, if you would like to provide, if you want uh, a, a more international perspective on, on uh, in indigenous or barriers to indigenous women participation, that would be great. Uh, my micro yeah, it, it does work right now. So on behalf of the United Nations, I would like to thank the organizers for um, bringing us into such a distinguished panel discussion this morning. Um, honorable members of parliament, distinguished panelists, um, uh, excellencies, members of the diplomatic corps and um, colleagues. Um, we first and foremost need to celebrate today 110 years since um, the International Women's Day uh, was first celebrated in Europe, actually, in Austria, Germany, Switzerland. We have come a long way. Um, however, as the High Commissioner of uh, the United Kingdom has just uh, read to us, much more is required for us to live in an equal world. The ideal world for the United Nations is indeed a world in which um, exercise of human rights is afforded to every human being and um, access to opportunities would be equally shared by all members of the society. I would first like to mention that there are very few countries that still have legal barriers um, that prevent women from the exercise of their rights. And this is because most of the countries of this world are members of the United Nations and that they have ratified the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. They also moved ahead and um, ratified the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination of all forms of discrimination against women and um, indeed uh, Samoa ratified it in 1992 and also the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, another important component of the Bill of Rights that Samoa also ratified in 2008. However, um, many countries that do host uh, indigenous um, communities would see a conflict between common law and customary law. And some social values and, and um, cultural norms uh, at the community level may create some barriers for women to be able to be active in the political life and in the public life of the country. I think it is true that women have carried the burden of this world we did it because we can and we could, and because we feel like it is our mission to do as much as possible for our uh, societies. However, the societies in exchange need to uh, guarantee our access to all human rights, and that's the world that we want 
uh, to see. We take a, a much broader approach to ensuring that we remove barriers. And I would like to uh, mention um, that it's very unlikely that a woman that has not been in <coughs> school, a woman that has not had a job, a woman that does not have financial independence, property rights, would be able to be a very active member um, of the, in the community, in the society. So we start by ensuring that women do have access to um, education. They are encouraged to um, pursue their aspirations. And uh, they do have a workplace in which um, <coughs> there is respect uh, and there, are, there is health safety and all forms of safety. And that women also have access to um, training opportunities to ensure that they develop their careers and training opportunities to be present in the uh, public life. That's how we remove barriers everywhere. That's what we do in Samoa as well. And thanking to um, our partners and to Australia in particular for funding very large initiatives that uh, support women, um, economic em women's economic empowerment and women in leadership. And I'm referring to the Women in Leadership in Samoa program, the increased participation in political life of women before. And we will continue to carry that particular, to carry out this mission of ensuring that we build an equal world. However, it is an important um, um, role that men should play as well. And uh, our exercise of rights would require that men recognize our rights and respect our rights, and we build a partnership in our families, in the community, and in the society. Where temporary special measures are so important to, again, create, uh, first of all, awareness uh, among women that they could be members of the parliament and then create that open space for women to actually become members of the parliament. We do know that until the society recognizes our rights and men um, uh, side by side with women uh, promote such rights, we will not see an equal world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simona, for that, those comments. Uh, we'll revisit some of them, perhaps uh, in a little while. Uh, Multalo, can I? You have the floor. Um, yeah. Yeah, Momoa na mole atule faftai. Mr. Foyle, the Foyeva no atawa. If I Foyona, the Fasoa, Minisi Foyo, the Maita Itawa, and Mr. Lavai. Too long of Ali, Suyo Palmin, Ole Palminio Samo. I may say love for E. Too long of Mafo Fanga, named Taupu. I'm Fitongi Vai. I'm the ACO for the Legal um, Policy and Investigation for the Office of the Electoral Commission. I, I read the topics before, I mean, during the weekend, and I also told uh, Malaysia, um, you know, for us, the electoral, we have to be neutral when it comes to politics. And uh, my comments today will uh, basically, I'll be the middle person. Well, I can see that I'm <laughs> also sitting in the middle. <laughs> so, from um, a legal or professionally, about the barriers, I will be talking about uh, the electoral law and uh, constitution. I mean, um, it's very interesting. I've heard here yeah, too long for year with us or my initials or to my time uh, two or four uh, barriers. However, in, um, we all know in the constitution that we have the quota system for our ladies in parliament. And with regards to the Electoral Act, uh, the whole Electoral Act is drafted to ensure that there is no barrier for women to be a member of parliament. I just want to quote something. Um, we made an amendment in the past and throughout the Electoral Act. Uh, there was always this, uh, the person to confirm Monotanga was always either the Fife'au or the Pulenu. However, 
we inserted inside the Suitamaita, uh, Suitamaita Il Nu, because um, the role of the Suitamaita Il Nu in terms of our field work when we go out to the villages and the constituencies, we tend to rely more uh, on them in terms of assisting us in terms of location, and they tend to show fairness. Uh, the men are more, they're, they're what, what, but as I said, our work is, is quite a lot of work, but it's neutral. Uh, and we work with the nominations, and we work with the nominations. And during the nominations, some of them, they tried not to use the suita maita ayolinu'u, to confirm, in which our office insisted no, it to salavale road, ile to langa, ole fati nonga, fa ambound yanga, ole montanga, e a mai ele suil nu, but the suta my tail nu. As of a pema, and they said, no, they don't, the suta my tail, ele loa, po why if I montanga, why ele if I montanga, ele. Mato ia ili mala malama fali tu lafono. O road siya lo tu siya mai la lo le la to ia ili tu lafono le women. I tu langa road siya o suita mai ta ima suyo nu. I tonu pe o le mafu angal na sa tamfaya i loa. I tu uwa ia suita mai ta ima amba o niya. Ana, that's my professional view and my personal view. Um, I, I, I really, I am with um, Rof Yunga Melissa. Ile tu langa lea o taia umma. I have a grandmother like that. Ita te ala ili fafango ta ita et pese lotu. And it, that shows o amata mai lava ili amatanga lava le aso. Amata mai lava ta ita ina tato e tina. Amata mai lava le oke se itu loa le oke mai ali tai hau tai tai po a tanga lu ngai fai tai tai o a ya 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 dal tai mi e e e ta o na lu a o ma ya tai ta la i think and i know it's mentioned before ole e amata mai la we tongo le ai e tongo le ai nga ma le tu langa ole o fe i lo tu pu anga a and that is what we've noticed when we go out, is some of our, some of the women in the villages, they do understand what our policies are, but they have limited knowledge on how these services, how the services see so, um, thank you, Leasio Langi, and welcome, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this uh, panel of very beautiful, uh, high esteemed panelists. This morning, so uh, I just wanted to make sure not to repeat what our other panel members have already contributed. So the question that was posed to us is: What are the barriers to women's political participation, and what has been done to overcome these barriers? Have uh, this measure been effective? So uh, I guess to me, there are two things we can look at. One is how to get more women into parliament. The second one is how do we make sure that they do stay in parliament and remain elected. So those are quite uh, interrelated, but very important aspects of having more women in parliament. But before I go on, I would like to highlight, just give some facts from the research that we have done, I guess with Malama in the previous years. So the facts really uh, speak for themselves of how, um, what is the issue that we are talking about and how serious it is. So for the Matai title, we are only looking at 10% uh, women in Samoa. 
So 90% are men. So it, it relates to the point that Manu, uh, Lee Manu has mentioned before about making sure there's more women participation in village uh, fono. The second um, facts I would like to highlight is only 5% of women actually do participate in village fono. And you, we all know the linkages between the importance of being in a village and being elected in parliament. So I guess the, the barriers itself, as uh, mentioned by other panel members, is having more women in village funnels, participate in village affair. But I guess from my perspective is, when are we ever gonna achieve that? In perhaps 50 years, 100 years, we're gonna have more women in, in village funnel and then make transition to parliament. So the question for us as well as, Somewhat. Do we need to change that system in the village? Do we need to make some interventions so that we have more women in village fono and pin? I guess it's asking us to really change the, the social structures and the social norms that we have. And I guess it is the Propose the swing of our pen. I turn over the tattoo to man of us more. So I guess that's the question. Are we gonna let evolution take its course and continue on with the way things are, or are we um, challenge ourselves to say that do we need to say the law say that we need to have eighty percent of women in uh, village vote? So it's just just me thinking out loud and giving out some measures of where we're going to make some real intervention if we are pushing for women in, in parliament. I guess the other barriers that the other panel members have mentioned is really attitude. Uh, even ourselves, women against women. Uh, it's not just the men. It's also the men looking at the women. It's also the women looking at the women. And the, full, and the perception that Politics is always something that belongs to the men. And I guess, as Tawala Papa has mentioned, I do share her views about, um, I guess if you want to go into parliament, you really have to open yourself up to being in that vulnerable space around the men, around the women, and willing to take the risk if you really want to go into parliament. And I. I listen to what's going on in Parliament, and I feel for those in Parliament, especially if you're on the other side of the, the table. It's quite different if you're on the other side. But I can imagine myself there, because I went overseas. I, I was brought up in a village, went overseas, study, come back, and now I'm going back to the village. And I do feel very vulnerable around even people in my own family or men, when you try to speak up as a woman, um, you know, you get shut down and say, oh, you, you, or, you know, that kind of mindset, that kind of attitude that we, real women do actually face when you go into your family, your village, um, you, you have been vulnerable, and sometimes the, the barriers, the, um, the discrimination is very subtle, like you can really, you can really feel it. But I guess we have to accept that and try and navigate and live with that. And um, and there's no there's no solution. You just have to be there if you want to win. If you want to win, and um, there are other times when you hear that from the women themselves that or. Uh, you know, you, you should know where you, you sit. But one of the women I've heard during some of the consultation, like if you really want to be in parliament and in village, uh, you have to actually eat with the village, live with the village, you know, and those are things that we as women uh, have to uh, overcome. So I guess that's my um, uh, contribution. But I guess the measures that we have had at the moment in terms of the quota, uh, to me, it's a temporary, it's to me really, it's a really a joke. If you want to have 10%, we need to fight for more women to be in parliament if we really, really want. 
because Samoa right now is ranked 165 uh, of about 192 countries in terms of having more women in parliament. Yeah, Vavtak. Um, you have the floor, Famul Mur. Good morning, everyone. I'm looking at my watch, and it's 5.10, and on the program it says questions from the audience start at 10.20. <laughs> so um, I'm just wondering, Malay, whether it might be better for us just to generally canvas the questions that are here. Um, and then, you know, the, our scribers can sort of arrange them in terms of, you know, the different... So, um, uh, perhaps just on the barriers, and I think uh, colleagues have um, commented, but, you know, in terms of legalities, the Matai issue is, of course, the, the main one, because that's a, a key qualification. You need to hold a title. Now, we do have a situation where some villages don't allow women to hold title, uh, so that, that would be a classic example of... Um, of a barrier. Um, the attitudes, yeah, I think we all are, agree on that. I was a bit um, curious about the bracketed indigenous um, in the first question. Um, you know, whether there's a particular vo focus that, you know, indigenous women um, experience higher degrees of barriers than non-indigenous women. Um, I think it, it's a historical factor. If, if you look internationally and historically, you know, women in the West faced the same things as indigenous women are facing now. So, you know, I think we, we need to be careful about, you know, the comparisons and so forth because um, I think the world round women all over, what color, you know, have all faced it. It's just, we are at different periods. So, um, because I think what they're calling sort of indigenous or, you know, customary, you know, it's just the same as, you know, the more uh, advanced democracies where the women face the same sort of discriminatory attitude. You know, it's a man's function to be the head of the family. They owned the women literally in terms of the law. They were chattels, first of their fathers and then of their husbands. So, you know, I think we need to get over that and just focus on what really is there. And it's essentially just attitudes and discrimination um, and holding power. You know, that's, uh, I think that's what that is about. Um, The 10% the thing, I think it was very interesting. Uh, we're talking about that. You know, Samoa, we did the 10% thing. Um, systematically, I think we presented a model of how it could be done. And that was useful for other countries in the Pacific who, you know, who were wrecking their brains. How do we do this, blah, blah, blah. So I think that was useful in that way. But the interesting thing, if we have a look, and you know, I take in um, Tola Papa's comments about the environment in, the, in Parliament. If you look at the actual debate of the House, if that was the measure, it, the, the, the law wouldn't have passed if you read that debate. So why we were able to pass it is because uh, the Prime Minister came back from the Cook Islands where the leaders made a declaration and said, look, we have to do this. Um, you know, there's also the expediency of, of politics, women voters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but whether, you know, the motivation from where it's drawn, and especially for those people who are making the decisions, if you look at that debate, you know, that's, it, it's a very sad picture, essentially, of, uh, of where it's at. Um, I, I think my, my friend here... Um, if we're looking at qualifications, um, I mean, if the Matai suffrage thing, you know, historically had a purpose for Samoa. We were a new country. The feeling was, 
it, you know, to be um, you know, steady, we needed to base it on the Fasam or the Famtai, and so forth. And that question comes up from time to time, especially when we're talking about the Electoral Act. Is that still the base from which we uh, should work? You know, and that sort of swings from time to time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not so much the question about do we keep the Matai suffrage base or do we do the population base. A lot of it is driven about the self-interests of the particular members in the House and how they would like the boundaries to be drawn. So, I mean, and you know, in gerrymandering, you know, doing the, the, the boundaries is, you know, they do it all over the world, so Samoa is not that different. But if we're talking about parliament being a representative body, is our parliament a representation of our society as we are today? So I think those are the sort of conversations we need to be having. And if we want a parliament that's representative of where we are today, then we have to look at, you know, what are the foundations that we base things on? Are they right? Um, and so forth. Um, one of the other things I wanted to say uh, on the question of why women don't get in. Um, so I, I agree totally with what's being said about some of the barriers. But interestingly, um, you know, I'm the president of the National Council of Women. We were doing a review of our constitution, you know, asking the question, you know, do we have a pur purpose? If it is, what is it, et cetera, et cetera. So that was, we had our internal um, consultations, and then we thought we'd do an external one and talk with other NGOs. So that was very interesting um, consultation with other NGOs, and then from that meeting, someone suggested, you know, the NGO uh, women's organizations sh should get together. Now, what I want to tell you about that meeting, it was really interesting. We had a, quite a lengthy discussion about why would we come together. So then it comes down to why do people get together? So, of course, being women's organizations, we said, well, it's about being women. Um, and then, because there are particular focus um, of some organizations, it said, well, you know, it's about this issue, that issue, and so forth. But it was very difficult to come down to the, um, to the basic uh, factor that we were there because we were women and we belonged to women's organizations. Gender identification. Um, so, you know, if we're doing about the push, how do we push women? Um, I think women have a lot to think about in terms of how they identify themselves. I mean, internationally, uh, even here in Samoa, the main push has come around groupings of women who have had a particular focus, professional women, uh, nurses, etc. Et now, for the National Council of Women, it's an, it's an organization for the village women. So that has a particular a focus. But we don't often talk about, you know, gender factors and what our status is, how, how are we seen in our society, you know, what do we want to do as women, do we have equal rights, uh, and so forth. That conversation doesn't really happen here. I don't know whether it's, uh, you know, it needs more time, or whether it's the Samoan psyche, you know, we family first, right, or village before you get to yourself. So I think those are a lot of the social conversations that uh, we, we need to be having. And the discussion about you know, women's uh, equality is um, amongst that mix. Um, I'm just, because this might be the last time I speak since I suggested um, whether there was something else. No, I think that's about it from me. Um, thank you. We'll leave our state. Uh it's, it's interesting. I mean, okay, time is obviously going to be a factor in there, our, our discussion. Uh, but some of the things which have uh, been pointed out already in that first uh, half an hour or so, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, property rights, uh, customary law, uh, financial constraints, um, the challenges of being neutral, not only as a public servant, but as a woman in the family <coughs> who is negotiating her way around the family members. 
uh, and and uh, when we start talking about indigenous women, I mean, in, in Samoa you could probably argue that if you are married outside your village, you are married into a village where you are not indigenous. Uh, you don't have rights there. You are a Nofutane, uh, and your rights in your village of your husband, if you're living there, are not the same as the rights that you have in your own village of birth. Um, so that's an interesting one. Uh, because although there is a change now, change in the sense that more and more marriages in this country are now within villages. Men and women from the same village. <coughs> Traditionally, that was frowned upon, punished. Um, but that's one of the many changes that we are trying to negotiate in this discussion. Um, and when we start talking about barriers and participation in the village fono, you may well be a Matai from your family, but if you're living in your husband's village, you can't participate in their fono. I mean, there, there are mechanisms, but that makes it even harder for women to participate in village councils. Uh, so, so there are a lot of barriers that we, we, when we say we, it's not just women, that men have to, to accept. And when we start talking about changes which we are going through, I mean, the, the statistics in a number of professional women, uh, excellent professional women this, doing this and that, yeah. there, there are so many changes happening in the last 50 years that we are not factoring into the traditional uh, barriers to women's progress. So, so we as a society then need to negotiate a lot of these things in order to come to terms with some of the issues about equality. Have, mentioning that word, equality, uh, it's a big one. I don't know whether anybody in the panel wants to contribute, whether that is a relevant word in the context of Samoan society. What is it that we're talking about? What equality are we talking about? Can I invite? Uh, I will be very brief and last time um, taking the floor as following Fiamma's model. Um, first and foremost, um, referring to the comment on the uh, political environment in which women would have uh, difficulty to navigate. Yes, the parliaments, political parties are actually quite aggressive um, environments. And as a former member of the parliament myself and a member of the government when I was very, very young, I need to say that I did experience that particular hostility myself. But women are fighters, and I think that would be the last um, you know, barrier um, to, to care about, honestly, that uh, the uh, particular uh, human environment um, in, in the public space would not necessarily be very pleasant. So we know how to fight. It's just that we need to be able to get there. The second point I want to make is that um, the Matai um, system does require a discussion, as uh, Samoa has ratified instruments that speak about universal suffrage, speak about uh, universal right to run. The three instruments that I, I made reference to do have explicit text in that regard. So what I'm saying is that being a Matai offers a, a, a structure that allows you to have the necessary uh, support of, of the village um, to be able to run. But outside that structure, any human being uh, in this country who is age eligible and who does have a good uh, record and a good standing should be allowed to run, should they wish to do so. So that's an aspiration that I very much hope that you know, the country will continue to pursue and one day we will see uh, that particular um, equity and, and um, uh, equality in uh, the public life as well. Uh, the third point I wanted to make is that women, whether indigenous or not, would need to have um, a system of services, support services, to be able to dedicate more time to the public life. 
in countries in which women are very present in the political space and public positions, public office, there are services that support with child care, with um, elderly care, that would, um, again, free time for women to dedicate um, their, their knowledge and their passion to the community, to the society, which we do not have here. My staff in the office every day, and in their vast majority are women, go to pick up kids from school. If you're a head of state or a member of the parliament, that would be quite difficult to do. So. We need to agree that while customary law does create barriers, we all know, and we welcome continued discussions on that, and we welcome more work by the Law Reform Commission to ensure harmonization between the two bodies of law, there are other things that need to also be in place to allow women to, to vote. And the last point is uh, to speak to Honorable Fiamme's comment on, on gender identity and how we see ourselves. <coughs> yes, there is a need for more self-confidence for women to be able to, you know, just um, shatter the, the glass ceiling and, and get to where they should be and we will all should be. And that's because, um, unfortunately, in the family from early age, they are being told that, you know, they're, they're, they need to fill a narrower space, that power is uh, practically a, a domain for the men. As we are all, um, you know, mothers, um, sisters, we need to understand that uh, ensuring that the young generation doesn't come with that bias and doesn't come with any kind of stereotypes, education is key. So we do have an obligation to make sure that our children, girls and boys, feel themselves more equal from, from early um, age. And women in Samoa and the Pacific are very powerful. I'm quite sure that should there be a, an open space for them to exercise their, their knowledge and experience, we would see much more prosperous societies. We would see much stronger social systems. Women in parliament make sure that the child protection bill is adopted, that gender-based violence is you know, dealt with, that uh, gender uh, budgeting and gender-based budgeting is in place. So we need to get there. Thank you. Okay, I mean, the, the, it's from what I, I gather, the, the theme for this year's International Women's Year is uh, choose to challenge. Choose to challenge, yes. Okay, so, so we've got a lot of uh, scope within that uh, theme to, to keep adding uh, to our conversation. But, you know, uh, one, one of the interesting things I've noticed is that we have this thing about 10% now of representation in Parliament, women. I challenge you by this thought that we do, if you look at the debates over the last parliament, certainly women have not been speaking for 10% of the time the parliament session. My point is you may have 10% of the women, but if you look at the contribution, that women make in the discussion, it's not even 10%. Okay? And you ask yourself why. And in the context of talking about equality, you might start asking that question and why. Uh, I don't want to make this a political issue, but it's just a fact. I, t I haven't looked at all the debates in the last five years, but just looking at some of the few. Uh, indicates that that is 10% contribution is not the case. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I, I'm not quite sure whether we should, I think the, the issues about indigeneity and uh, women's leadership, confidence in women's leadership have been sort of tapped upon, referred to uh, uh, during all the, the contributions so far. But maybe at this point, I can invite some contributions from the floor before we move on to other issues. Uh, on those uh, questions, five questions of international significance. Can I, can I ask uh, any contributions from the floor? Questions, comments? I'm sure there are lots. <laughs> Thank you. 
Tadafalaba, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Grace Aumua, and I'm the president of the Peer to Peer Initiative. We are an initiative that um, are the voices, we're representing the voices of our peers on campus. So, my question is for Lawafi Yong Ali Oman Ali Ali Iman Man Walofa. You mentioned a while ago in your discussion that we do not need money to serve your constituency. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other ways that we can do to serve our constituency. So would you kindly elaborate more on these other ways where we, the new generation and future generation of our country's women, uh, can serve our constituency? Um, thank you. I'm sure Honorable Fear may will um, help me out on that. But, um, you know, getting into parliament uh, where you mix with all these men, the talk is you often hear is how much they spent uh, on campaigning and how much they're giving out every week, every month, and it sort of discourages you and you sit back and thought, wow, we really have to spend that lot. And it's always that talk that goes around uh, that sphere that I believe discourages some of the very potential women that should have been in parliament by now. Um, but getting back to your question, you do need some money when you're starting to campaign, not necessarily more than 20,000. <laughs> but I mean, when the men talk about money for campaigning, they talk of 200,000, 300,000, so forth. But to us personally, you just need that uh, small financial packing for uh, necessary, um, what the electoral office would say is, what you call it, statutory expense? Anyway, um, but as I say, there's a lot you can do rather than financially. As I say, Fia Mir will help me out. When you get into parliament, there's a lot of services offered, and that's where you get to understand a lot of financial uh, assistance from different donors, <coughs> different partners that you can tap on where your village really need that sort of development because when you get there, you have to see what is it they need, not what the government imposes on them. You have to get from them what they really need to develop first. And that's the beauty of being in parliaments because you get to understand then where you can get that assistance and also your services. <coughs> Just being in there, you know, when you have a fair education, um, as I've heard Melissa was saying, that we really need to tap on that encouragement for our women out in the district. And that's where those with um, good education background come in to help them. Because you'll find that whatever offer of assistance through your knowledge, uh, through your experience, you'll find that they really appreciate it because they didn't have that, experience, that um, opportunity like what we did. And that's how I find mixing with the women in community, not necessarily you give them things, but it's just sharing your knowledge in order for them to get some idea of how to get their own uh, developments get going, and then you being in parliament get to appear and get to the relevant uh, ministries, organizations, uh, donors, to try and help where you can. And also for your church activities, being a treasurer, being a um, one of the secretaries, a lot of those services. I really believe being a member of parliament is a servant, is a service. It's a service you offer for the good and betterment of the bigger community rather than individual. And that's a message I will still carry on to put, uh, advocate for so that people will understand that Members of parliament are not there for financial, as, as a financial provider, but to assist and serve them 
in whatever developments they need to, they need to do uh, for the betterment of a community. Have I answered your question? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my next question will be for um, <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Fiamena Ta'afa. What is a challenge that you have for women who want to be part of politics but are afraid of the barriers that they are about to face within the environment that, we would, that they will join? What is a challenge that you have for women who want to be part of politics but are afraid of the barriers that you've all mentioned? Well, it's the obvious question. Why do you want to do it, right? So if, you, if we believe what Tala Papa says, what would any sensible woman want to do it? <laughs> 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 so first of all, you know, you need to understand what your motivation is because, you know, that's, that's the driving factor. So, you know, it's not about what other people are thinking, it's about where you are at and what you want to, to achieve. You know, too often I think, you know, we live our lives about how other people, you know, whether it's other people, society, whatever, how other people, you know, sort of say, this is what you can do and so forth. So it's not about what other people think, it's about what you think. But then you have to understand the environment that you are in and work through that. You know, but if you don't really have the motivation or you're not very clear about it, you're always going to be worried about what other people think. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and happy International Women's Day to all the women around the world as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, there you, could, go. you know, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for this young lady. I, I think I just want to bring it down very personally. I mean, this is Women's Day. So I don't know about you girls, but for me, from when I was little, you know, to where I am now, I think, you know, the biggest motivation for me is I, I want to live my life how I want to live it. I don't want other people to tell me how to live it. I mean, we all have to factor in, you know, our societies, you know, what the expect expectations are. But I think that's the very clear, you know, motivation about, you know, you want to live your life in a particular way and you want to live it in a particular kind of environment. So it's all those sorts of things. And I think for women, it's really tough for us, you know. Not only women, you know, poor people, disabled people, but ultimately the human endeavor is we want to live our lives how we want to live it. So. <laughs> okay, uh, do we have any more comments from the audience? Questions? Down there. Uh, hi, my name is Vaile von Dinklage. I'm a first degree student and majoring in media. Um, so my question is for you, Honorable Fiume Naomi. It's just a follow-up question from my sister over here. <laughs> Um, lately, um, I mean, recently was the parliament seatings that was, um, uh, what you call it, that was aired on television and all the medias. We see how men treats women in parliament. We know, like, it's sort of, it's, they're like downgrading women. And I know, like, for some women, they are now thinking that they don't want to enter parliament. But, like they say, women can help when advising um, what to do, you know, like, I think the same um, role um, can apply to parliament as well. But what do you advise women? Like, can they take up the challenge, you know? Like, even what can women actually do to overpower men in parliament? <laughs> Sorry, but that's the question on my mind. Oh, well, we could go on strike. <laughs> That would really bring, you know, the place to a stop. The wives go on strike, the mothers go on strike. No. Um, you know, it's, um, it's about how, how the world is seen. So it would be fair to say that 
the way the world, our world is seen is very much through men's eyes, right? So I think we need to, and you know, I'm linking this into that whole representative um, parliamentary purpose. So if, if parliament is supposed to be representing us and how we see the world, we need to change that worldview. We need to say the world that you think you're in is actually not the world that it is, right? And it's because of this and this. And I think I agree with Brenda about the, the caliber of the discourse. So if we don't have that kind of conversation, whether it's in parliament, you know, whether it's in our universities or whether it's in our village fauna, if we don't have that sort of discussion, nothing really changes. So, you know, which you know, you have to hold to have that conversation about do we agree about, you know, are we having a shared world vision here or a local vision or family vision? Whatever. But you can't really do it in yourself. You know, you have to be talking with your community and have that shared conversation. Thank you. Um, just a question for all of you, sorry. Um, what do you think of the media coverage um, for women? Um, I know that we see on media it's always the men doing the job, like, but we have women who are CEOs, presidents, ministers, but we usually see the men on media doing interviews. Is it a women's thing to turn down interviews, or is it, you know? Just very briefly, um, and thank you for the question. I was about to, to take the floor just to address that. Um, in response to what Honorable Member of uh, the Parliament Tuao mentioned, and also Fiamme's point, I think the media in this country, like anywhere else, plays a critical role first to educate the voters. Voters need to learn what exactly is the role of a member of the parliament, why they transfer the power, they give the mandate to someone in the community to represent them in the parliament, and to understand that the value that the member of the parliament brings is not during the campaign, but is, you know, five years being there and promoting development and pushing the government to do something in the community and to address the needs of the community. That's a critical education part that the media could help us and other institutions to do it. And unfortunately, very little um, has been done for even uh, this campaign that is so important to the country. Why this campaign is very important to the country? We are emerging from a crisis. We are also deep into the pursuit of, of the 2030 agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals. We really need to care who are the new leaders um, emerging from the elections. The second point is the reflection of women, of um, you know, the, the role that they bring into the society, the role that they can bring into the political life of, of the country, and speak about the value of women's perspective in the political dialogue, which I have not necessarily seen in um, uh, the media. And again, I apologize for the uh, media in, in, the, uh, in Samoan, as I'm only reading um, uh, the ones in, in English, but I think there is much more that uh, the media could do. You are a critical power in every country. You're the guarantor of the balance of power between the executive and the legislative and, and the judiciary, and you need to do more. And in that regard, of course, we take the blame as well, the United Nations, for not having invested enough in the media to ensure that that role is properly played. Some programs exist at this point in time, uh, but, uh, but not enough uh, to, again, ensure the media is strengthened and the independence of the media is strengthened. And my last point is that if there is one big barrier that I think Brenda spoke about and my co-panelist also mentioned is domestic violence. Women who are exposed to domestic violence will never be able to, you know, build back self-confidence and, and deal with the trauma. Very few women, and I'm looking at some of them in this room, have managed to emerge from that very successfully. But that's a, that's a, a key topic for anybody coming out of this election into a power position in this country. And change comes from within. 
Change comes from the community, and that's something that we absolutely want to see. We have this huge program, the Spotlight Initiative. We also want to promote more sexual and reproductive and health rights in this country so that women are in control of their bodies, women are in control of their future, and women are protected against violence of all forms. Thank you. Uh, would this mean you'll be investing in media? Uh, happy International Women's Day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there, are there any other comments? This is one, one thought that came. You are talking about uh, people defining people's roles. I mean, I often hear, almost daily, uh, both from, you know, all walks of life and even in church, people find my only, only role of the mighty. And I was reminded by one of my friends lately, the comments he made. But literally, meaning referring to Omeo, when we used to have old houses, we used to have small river stones or pebbles inside. And when children uh, play on those, they sort of uh, make a mess uh, of those pebbles and those river stones. And you know, the mothers are supposed to come in and sort of smooth them over and put the mats over them and so on. Uh, from that traditional scene to now, the auli, to iron things, uh, uh, that's another role that's been assigned to women. Uh, so they smooth the floors and they iron the clothes. And the people I hear mostly saying that are men. And keep reminding that role, both in village, church situations, and so on. Uh, I don't know, how do you react to that? Members of the panel. <laughs> I've talked a lot. You know, no no comment. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I guess um, there are traditional and cultural expectations for Samoan women. Um, and there are the challenges that we face now in modern life. And some and women have to respond to those. And sometimes they do it in ways that are non-traditional and unusual. But they bring a broad perspective to where they, where they are um, because of their role as nurturers and carers. And that is exactly the type of contribution that societies and extremists like ours uh, need all the time, not just now, but all the time. So um, I, I've never been able to get my head around the, um, the Aoli part. I think um, generally I have an idea that they, um, they bring calm to stormy waters. Um, but the sort of stormy waters that we face in 2021 have never been faced before. So we need to use all of our strategies and wisdom uh, to apply ourselves to supporting our communities to sort that out. So the discussions um, that we've heard from um, suggested by the Honourable Fia Me and also Murtalo and um, are true about looking at ourselves to work out uh, what the things that we already have can be readjusted to meet um, the challenges that we're facing. Um, I mean, this conversation is a constant question. Why do you need more women in public life? Why do you need more women directors? Why do you need more women doctors, lawyers, accountants, academics, students? 
Um, and it's because women bring a broader perspective on everything. Mm. And, um, and that's what I think often is not valued and not valued and made worthy um, in, in ways that... Um, and how people are selected for things. Um, you know, we spoke about the media just before. The media have stood in the breach of not having an official opposition in the House. And they've carried that role, I think, um, often courageously and bravely. But the access we now have to the range of different channels and radio um, and internet um, means that for the first time there's communication from women about what they want and how they feel. So I think we, there is a great um, advance in the rest of the community knowing um, what will make um, the lives of women and all the people they nurture and care for better. Um, so I, I really um, record my appreciation to our local media for continuing on um, and allowing that means of communication, which I think will have an impact. I think it has an impact now in terms of choices. And women now have choices that they didn't have a year ago. And I think that's magnificent. And it's something that, that needs to be um, acknowledged on this very special, as Simona said, the 110th anniversary of something grand and wonderful. I hope this will be the last time I speak. Uh, getting back to your question on the Pai and Auli. Uh, with us ladies in Parliament. Um, I believe we often do it uh, when it's the right time, when there's a lot of that to and fro, and it doesn't involve us. Um, but when the remarks are leveled at you, then you will just have to be the fighter. Um, <laughs> You have to speak, but I, I know often us ladies, uh, when there are very heated uh, arguments, uh, or sometimes through our normal speech, then uh, say something along those lines, being the Pai and Auli in parliaments, but often we don't um, do it when there are heated arguments, because I believe you don't want to be a dormant. <laughs> when the language uh, leveled at you are uh, not a uh, right time to play that role as a woman uh, in parliament. Uh, just a brief touch on the media where she said why the women and CEOs run away from them. I believe because women want to be perfect and they want to be ready. Um, you know, they want to be rated that excellent about their performance when they are in the public, um, you know, when they are in the media. Uh, whereas with men, and you'll have to excuse me on that, they can just speak anything they, that comes into their mind because they don't care. <laughs> but with the women, you know, how they organize things at home and everywhere, they want to, they are specific. I still recall Honorable Fiamme calling, uh, pulling me on the side on my first week in Parliament while we were um, at one place. And I think she noticed me running away from every time the media comes around uh, to me. And she pulled me and said, Alofa, you, you're a public figure now. You have to face the media. So even though I'm still not up to it now, but I'm trying to be brave and be confident when I speak. I think I'm getting there when I speak on the, on the TV. Well, at least that proves what we said before, what uh, Mulyang tell us. You've got to be a leader in order to be able to lead. You can't, it's kind of hard to be a leader when you are not playing that role. Uh, 
So, uh, are there any comments on what we said so far uh, from the floor? Yeah. Hello for everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michelangelo, I'm an analyst and audience. I'm a member of the peer-to-peer -peer initiative, and right now the peer-to-peer -peer are holding a live stream. And I have here a couple of questions from the students there, and they said to come voice them out. Uh, my question for the panelists, please. Um, do you believe that having more women in political leadership in Samoa provides a different kind of voice inside parliament? <laughs> I hope you guys got your answer. <laughs> um, another question is, what impact does CEDAW have on empowerment of the women in the r rural areas of Samoa? Yeah, I just, <laughs> I, I, I just want you to answer both questions very briefly, if I may. So we do have a huge amount of research showing that parliaments uh, that have a larger, broader participation of women, governments with more women, and you know, public um, uh, positions uh, uh, with more women um, being, being present, uh, lead to, first of all, as I mentioned, more prosperous societies. Women represent half of, half of the um, humanity, so they are around 50% in every country. So giving them the possibility to um, be present in the public life would again be, bring the perspective of a very large part of the society. But it's not only that. Again, there are critical laws, critical policies that the society needs that women would always pay attention to. Because we iron and we cook and we wash, we know much more about life and the <coughs> needs of the family and of the community, and we bring that into uh, the politics, and we bring that into everything we do in policy making and law making. So that's important. CEDO is, a, is an instrument that speaks about empowerment of women everywhere. And again, countries ratifying need to translate that into national legislation, into everything that the country does. And that's something that is being monitored. There is a reporting that comes every four years. There will be another one next year. I'm looking at Mele UN Women in 2022. That uh, Samoa will again be reviewed uh, by CEDO. And uh, makes no distinction among women, whether they live in urban or rural areas. For us, all women are equal, and that equality is what CEDAW monitors and presents recommendations to the country every year, and we monitor progress. There is a lot more that needs to be done. This country has adopted the uh, Community Law Center um, Act that is supposed to provide uh, legal aid services in all villages everywhere, and that has not yet been enforced. There are lots of other laws that have not been totally enforced. There will be a law on social protection, hopefully soon, that also brings benefits to the country and goes deep into the community where poorer families, poorer households live. So look at CEDAW as an instrument that is meant to help all women, regardless of their walks of life, age, and, and geography, um, to exercise rights everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from the panel on, on that? Uh... Mele, uh, it might just lead on to one of the questions uh, specifically for Samoa. And the number two, what do you think has contributed to women running in this election? And it says, you know, this is the highest number. It might be the highest number, but it's not that much more than some of the other elections. So it's not a groundswell, you know, that's happening. I just wanted to make that point. Um, because when you're talking about something significant, you know, you'd say, you know, it's a 50% increase or it's a 100% increase. I think um, the difference might be three. So I just wanted to make that point. It actually isn't a significant increase. And in fact, that should be more the concern, that there are not that many running, rather than saying that this is the most that have, that have run. Uh, just, but if they, all, if they all get into the parliament, there will be almost 50% of the parliament, so <laughs> vote for women. Yeah, uh, well, it's only one more, I think, from the last election. I think the last one was 23, so. Yeah. Yeah, less no. than.
One more question from the, the live stream. Um, my last question is, how much does equitable female representation influence democration representative, representative, like on family planning, economy, education, and et cetera, for women? You ask again the question. How much does equitable female representation influence dem democration representative like on family planning, economy. Yeah, I'm just reading what they say. Um, education and et cetera for women. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a brief comment then from. Uh, we 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 did that. answer the question, and again we we see through all the uh, engagement of the United Nations along those themes that women are extremely powerful in conveying that message and taking that lead. So obviously, um, it's less likely that on some of those topics, men alone will be um, you know, successful in promoting uh, the right policies and the right legislation. It should be a partnership. We both, men and women, bring value to uh, the political life of every country. And that's what we want to see here as well. Thank you. OK. Malo, uh, just, just uh, if there are no comments from the audience, just that question number one under country-specific program. Um, political party impact on influence of women running. Uh, any comments on that? I mean, we, it's already been noted that there's only one extra from last, last election, so obviously so far as numbers are concerned, not very much. Yeah, uh, Ulianga? What's the question again? Sorry. It's number one on the local. Okay. Yeah. It's on or influence women running? I, I, I guess my immediate response to the question is they, they should. But unfortunately, historically at the moment, they do not have much impact on women running as much as we would like to. Um, because they are, well, I guess we all know there are only a few parties and party politics is, does not really uh, much develop in Samoa as much as we would like to. But one of the things that would be really good if we looking at developing parties is for parties to have um, a quota on number of women candidates within their party politics and policies. But um, I probably feel me as more experienced with this. But that's my uh, observation with the political system here in Samoa. Um, the party, party politics doesn't not really, you know, it's only near election that you hear to hear about policies and that, but during a five-year period, well, it would be really good if they have that sort of development into looking at uh, how many women they're looking at targeted as, say, 30% or 40% or 50% of their members uh, should, be, should be women. But it, it's pretty much based on individual preferences, mm. not so much on gender-based uh, okay. poli yeah. politics. Uh, I, I completely agree with Muliana Tili. Um, I think political parties need to subject themselves to the same principles that everybody else is in terms of their manifesto, um, the number of women that should be part, um, candidates, all of those things. Um, I also think that there, when you have a one, one party in power for so long, that um, fealty or loyalty to the party has actually overwhelmed the standing orders. So you have a parliament that allows anybody to comment on anything that, that they believe they can contribute to, 
yet you have a rule that is external from Parliament which stops them from making critical comment on something that has been already decided. And that means that a party rule has actually superseded democracy. And that needs to stop. Okay, okay. yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, Fiume. Okay, um, very quickly, I just put down on that question, there's a lot of potential for political parties to, you know, to do the gender thing. Um, but there's no articulation um, with the respective parties um, about that. Um, but I did make a comment in this last session about political parties. Um, and I think, you know, what is a political party? How it works in Samoa, it's mostly, it kicks in for election, and then it's all about people who are elected, who come in. But, you know, in terms of an organization, a political party being an organization that, you know, has national affiliates, doesn't really work that way. Um, and this is one of the challenges that I think, um, if we want to progress on political parties, you know, we have to make it more, um, that kind of organization. And it, it will help with the representational um, issues as well within, um, because it's not enough just to, you know, um, bring in the, the, the elected members and just work with them, because then it just becomes about how you work the system and the people that you're in there. You're not necessarily having that broader uh, base uh, in the societies and, you know, people's um, political aspirations and what they have expectations of their members. So I think um, Simona, um, the UN, and I think assisted by Australia, has been doing a lot of work you know, with the political stuff. And it's quite interesting. Um, you know, they've done work with parliamentarians, they've done work with women, they've done work with youth, and they've done work with media. But when they've tried to do work with political parties, they just got a big wall that went up. No, we don't want to talk to you about political parties. Right? And the reason for that is that this is a nice little control factor, don't really want to have that open conversation about you know, political parties and how actually political parties can be used to further you know, particular causes, gender, particular development agendas, uh, and so forth. So it comes to control factor, I think. You know, it's very nice and compacted and not that transparent. So I think uh, political parties is a big thing that we need to look at if we want to further, uh, you know, the evolution of our politics and how we elect people, how we come to decisions and things like that. Yes. Uh, Just very so briefly, uh, indeed, we, we had this conversation with Honorable Fiamme who uh, pointed out the need for the United Nations to get involved with political parties, it is in the mandate of the United Nations to strengthen political institutions, starting with, with political parties and um, maybe an area of, of priority as we move forward um, in Samoa. And um, I agree, I totally agree with the need for a quota for the political parties, um, and that's something that should be uh, loudly uh, voiced in this country. Maybe the media will help us to make that uh, known to um, Samoa that political parties would need to be themselves promoting more women candidates. At the same time, I think what is critical is that the manifesto of a political party to be clearer and much stronger on gender equality topics and on promotion of women and women's empowerment. We just reviewed the Samoa 2040, a draft of the Samoa development strategy. There is not much um, there with respect to uh, gender equality. What is needed to fill the gap, what is needed to have more women represented in, uh, in the public life, in, in business, and, and everywhere in the society. So both the uh, strengthening the capacity of political parties and ensuring they have a quota as well as working with them on manifesto that would put at the center gender equality would be necessary. And again, a, an area in which I do hope uh, that my team will engage soon. Thank you. Yeah, Mulianga. 
I, I just wanted to add to the conversation that I think also uh, if for this to happen, we also need to look at our voting system as well to allow for to allow for political parties to really develop uh, countries where, where else will have actually changed the the voting system in order to enable the uh, you know the emergence of uh, political parties, which uh, I think for us Samoa we haven't really had any political reforms for. Uh, many, many years, and I think we understand why that is the case, because it's just too political. And lack of, I guess, lack of social moments on any change is one of the, the biggest issue here for us in Samoa, because of the way our society works. So my friend here, uh, please change your voting system. <laughs> Because that will really, really help us with try and develop our parties and to address the issue of gender inequality and more women political participation. Uh, Murtalo? Um, um, before I make any comments with regards to uh, Muliana Tele, I just want to confirm the confirmed candidates, uh, women candidates, is 24 now, but no, but one, well, the ones that was um, accepted by the commissioner was 24, initially 24. However, one is Honorable Fiamme uncontested and one was disqualified. So now it's 22 uh, for the election. Yes, initially it was 24. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, one uncontested. Um, yes, with regards to political party, I am, I'll be commenting from our view. Uh, seven political parties were registered uh, within this five-year uh, period. And most of these uh, registered political parties, well, one, two main was from the previous election. And all of it, uh, was registered about two years ago. I think timing and you know ensuring that there is good planning for these, as Honourable Fiamis uh, stated, it's a matter of um, organising it and ensure that the women uh, participation within these political parties are encouraged. So um, I think it's timing. Uh, for the setup, because most of these political parties were only registered a year or two years before the election. Uh, so, like, after the election, and if it is the system that we want to introduce and to ensure that all our women issues are addressed, yeah, I think it's form up here, your political parties, but not to wait until, say, and three, four of these political parties, women are actually the, the ones that are, the, are leading these political parties. Yeah, it's just a comment. I wonder if the level of political awareness in the community is better now than it was last time. Uh, our Vice Chancellor started off by quoting fantastic figures of women representation, enrollment, and things like that. Uh, can, can I invite comments on that? Is there a difference between, can we, is it fair to conclude the level of awareness from representation in parliament? Or can we also look at community participation in leadership issues along those levels? 
Does that make sense? If I were to judge the level of awareness of equality, whatever, gender issues, by the number of representation in parliament and the number of women who stood in the last election and this election, I think the conclusion is fairly kind of neutral, if not negative. But I wonder if that is a fair indication of the level of participation at the grassroots level. I'll just go first to um, allow uh, other panelists to bring back more information than I have myself. So first of all, we um, talk about 75% of the um, NGOs, civil society organizations in this country being um, headed by women, which is a clear indication that women are taking on that role um, in all areas. So NGOs cover a wide range of topics in, in this country. Very importantly, through and owing to the support that we receive from, from donor countries, and I'm again thankful to Australia, to the UK, to New Zealand and other partners, we have advanced a lot into taking information down to um, the village. And through the Women in Leadership, we've had um, uh, a very, very strong engagement and strong advocacy around such issues. So if you go on TV, and I'm quite sure you, you saw that, that um, video um, clip, we practically went all the way down to say vote for women in Samoa, which we usually do not do, not to create any positive discrimination. We say women are strong candidates, women are capable leaders, but here we just went to the um, heart of the problem and said please vote for women in this country. So advocacy um, has been very strong and investment in awareness in the community throughout all of our programs, Spotlight as well, and everything we do, uh, the Knowledge Society program is meant to, so the number of candidates is not necessarily a just reflection of that, but it takes much longer time. The social response is slow, so we need to continue that investment. When you change a tax, you see the impact the next day. It's not the same when you want to change you know, behaviors, attitudes, perceptions, mindsets. So we will continue to uh, make that investment. And the candidates this year are very strong. So they may not be more than in 2016, but they are very strong, and I'm quite sure we'll see them in the next parliament. Thank you. I wonder, Melissa, if, if I can express a view. Um, I think there has been greater public engagement in politics in the last, I guess, eight months than I've ever seen in the last 25 years since I've lived here. Um, I think that the number of, of those standing is not uh, represented um, in that. And, and the other thing is, by requiring such an early registration of candidates so far out, I think if it was closer to the time, like last month, there would be more. But that requirement to register at least, um, if it's all me, how many months, five months before the election, um, six months before the election, you know, a lot of the, 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 the political um, rise of ordinary people has taken place in the last six months. So it absolutely would not be reflected in the number of candidates. And I, and I agree with Simona um, in terms of um, quality, not quantity. Um, and, it, it, um, and I think that that's also, maybe that's another structural issue um, that needs to be considered after the election, is the question why do you have to register um, not only your party but as a candidate so early? Um, because I think that's, that's, that's skewed the numbers. Papa, can I ask uh, Limal Manu? Uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, I, 
I agree with Simona and Talababa with what has already been said. And I think it's safe to say that the level of political awareness in the community is much better now than it was before. And um, one point I'd like to mention um, is those women leaders that have gone before us, uh, we are here with Honorable Fiume and others that may have left the parliament, but they have led the way for those particular constituencies to prove that the women can lead. It's the other constituencies that haven't had the opportunity of a woman in leadership position in parliament that I think we really need to work on uh, in order to get, because once a, a woman gets into parliament and prove herself, like in the case of uh, Honorable Fia May, then it's established in the minds of the people of that constituency that the women can lead. Mm. And um, I think that's, that's the only point I want to add on to what has already uh, uh, been said. And it's, it's really safe to say that the political awareness is much better now. And I really believe that we won't need the quota this time. I'm positive of that. Thank you. Uh, huge success. Um, we have to uh, bring our discussion to an end, uh, but I'd like before that to thank you very much to our panelists for joining us. Uh, huge topic, of course, and two hours is only a small time to try and, and, and talk about some of the issues as raised. But nevertheless, thank you very much for our normal to tell me that the fellow elite I am to 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 our sponsors, uh, United Nations, uh, our United Kingdom, Australia, and others. Thank you very much for supporting this. Uh, it's sort of become a natural part of, of, our, uh, of our calendar. Uh, and uh, we look forward to the next one. Meanwhile, between now and the next International Women's Year, we wish you all the best. And thank you very much to our audience for uh, coming along and participating, uh, and particularly those young people who ask questions. I really, really appreciated that. Our technicians and everybody who's working very hard to uh, organize these things, uh, great. Ramona, thank you very much. Uh, for being a very strong supporter and relentless in your efforts to try and organize this properly. Thank you so much to the media guys who are, we look forward to seeing the thing on television later on. Uh, so have a nice week, everybody, and we wish you all the best. We have some uh, refreshments at the back. Yeah. Okay. Fafta, Ramona.